All right, if you missed class today, you'll find this review sheet on Canvas, and you might want to try it first before you watch this video uh, so that when I go over it, you will just be comparing your answers. So this is a walkthrough of very much like what your short answer is going to look like for the test tomorrow. Um, so the first thing that you're going to be asked to do is you're going to be asked to cut a DNA segment and then draw in the bands that you would see on an electrophoresis after the different cuts were made. So uh, at the top we have our DNA segment. It is a total of 750 base pairs long. The first thing it asks you to do is to show the positive and negative poles, and that's going to be a point. Negative needs to be at the top, positive needs to be at the bottom, because remember DNA is negative and it's going to travel towards the positive end, so that's the first thing. Next, you need to make your own scale. So remember, in an electrophoresis, larger pieces travel more slowly. So it's very important that you start with your bigger numbers and then your numbers get smaller as you progress. So if I look at, my, at the top at my original DNA segment, I see that it's 750 base pairs long, which basically means that if I didn't cut this piece of DNA at all, the biggest band I would possibly have would be 750 base pairs long. So I'm going to use that as my starting point. Notice that I put it a little bit uh, below my original wells because all the DNA is going to travel, even a really big piece. It's just going to be very slow. All right, I can also see as I look through this that if I was to cut this DNA into pieces, my smallest piece that I could possibly get would be 50 base pairs long. So I need to make a scale that uh, has a, a spot for something as big as 750 and then a spot for something as small as 50. So it does not have to necessarily be proportional. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to make 500, 250, 100, and then 50. Um, and technically, the DNA wouldn't necessarily travel in a proportional way anyhow, so it's okay that my distances are not exactly perfect. It's fine. All right. In lane one, they want us to show the results if we loaded DNA that was not cut at all. So I load my DNA, and I know that my piece is 750 base pairs long, so at the end of my electrophoresis, I should basically just have one band that's 750 base pairs long. It would have been big and heavy, and it wouldn't have traveled very far. In lane two, I'm putting DNA that's been cut with EcoR1, my first enzyme. And if you look up at the top, EcoR1 cuts in two spots. One, two. So my original DNA is going to be cut into three pieces. Piece number one, piece number two, and piece number three goes all the way to the end. So I should get a band that's 100 base pairs long, one that's 250, and one that's 400. This, this entire length of the, of the rest of the band. So I'm going to draw in a 100, a 250, and I'm going to estimate back here a 400. If you're concerned that I'm not going to be able to tell where your bands are, you know, that they're not going to line up, you can always write the numbers in. It's okay. It's not necessary, but you can do that. Next, we're, use, we're looking at DNA that was cut with the other enzyme instead, HEND3. So if I go back to my DNA, I'm going to put it back intact again here, and I'm only going to cut it with my other enzyme, HEND3, which cuts right here. That means my original DNA would be cut in two pieces, one that's 50, and then my the rest, which is basically going to add up to 700. I add those uh, numbers all together. So I'm going to have a, a band way back here at 700, and I can actually write it in just to make it clear, and then one all the way down here, a really tiny band, that made it all the way to 50. Remember, all the bands are starting in the, in the well and then traveling in this direction. And then finally, in lane four, I am putting what I would get if I cut the DNA with all of the enzymes. So I have DNA in a tube, I mix it with both enzymes. My DNA would get chopped up in all of these spots and I'd get four bands, a 100, a 250, a 350, and a 50. So 50, 100, 250, 350, and I can put that in just to make it very clear. Now, one way you can double check yourself, since our original DNA was 750 base pairs long, no matter how many pieces I cut it into, my bands should all add up to 750. So one band at 750, that's 750. Three bands, 400 plus 250 plus 100, adds up to 750. 700 plus 50 
adds up to 750. And 350 plus 250 plus 100 plus 50 adds up to 750. Because we haven't lost any DNA. It's just a matter of whether we have one piece, two pieces, five pieces, however many pieces we have, it should all total up to the original link. So that is how you would do a, an electrophoresis. Um, and that's going to be worth six out of the 15 points of the short answer. All right, our second thing you'll need to be able to do is you'll need to be able to match a child to a father. So I have here a daughter horse, a mother horse, and four possible fathers. Now remember, the idea is that a child's DNA is not going to match either of the parents perfectly because the parent only gives half their DNA to the child. So the child's going to match the mother, like half mom, half dad. So I noticed that the daughter and the mother have these bands in common. That's your first step. Eliminate all the bands that the daughter could have gotten from the mother. That leaves us with these two bands, this one and this one. If she didn't get them from the mom, she had to have gotten them from her dad. So we are looking for a father that has to have both of those bands, not just one. And the only father that meets that criteria is father number three. So that would be the correct father in this scenario would be father number three. Okay, here, these are restriction enzymes, are possible restriction enzymes, and it's showing where they cut a DNA segment. The first question asks, which ones are palindromic? So I rewrote them at the bottom just to clarify for you what a palindromic sequence means. So remember, DNA is anti-parallel. So the five to three of one side is the opposite of the other side. A palindromic sequence means that when I read it in the five to three direction, I should get the same code. So my first one, G, C, A, T, C, G, then my other direction would have to read the same code. So here it is, G, C, A, T, C, G, but when I read it the other way, it's C, G, A, T, G, C. That's not the same, right? Um, in, in, in fact, it's, it starts and ends with C's, not even G's. So this would not be a palindromic sequence. Second one, G-A-A-T-C, all right? So G-A-A-T-C, when I read the other way, it is not the same, G-A-T-T-C. So this would not be palindromic either. Now is my third one, G-G-C-C. -C. When I read it the other way, G-G-C-C. -C. So this is palindromic, so three is palindromic, and a, G, T, A, C, T, A, G, T, A, C, T. Four is also palindromic. So three and four. Um, again, you're looking for the code to be exactly the same. Now, why does the code have to be exactly the same? The code has to be exactly the same because if it's not, the enzyme is not going to recognize it. In other words, if I look at um, number three here, my enzyme is looking for G, G, C, C. So the enzyme finds G, G, C, C and it makes a cut between the G and the C. On the other side, the enzyme attaches specifically to GGCC, so it found the code and cuts in between. So this enzyme would cut all the way through the DNA. This would be what's called a blunt cut because it cuts straight through. If we look at number four, the code is A-G-T-A-C-T, -T, so the enzyme finds the code and attaches, and it cuts between the G and the T, so right here. Now the enzyme attaches to the same matching code on the other side, and it cuts between the G and the T, which would be here. This would leave what's called sticky ends. This makes what's called a staggered cut. And the easiest way, so number four is your answer here to which one makes a staggered cut. Now some people in class were like, well, why doesn't two make a staggered cut? Because one way I told you you could recognize it is whether or not the same number of letters were on each side. If it's the same number of letters on each side, it should make a blunt cut. And if it's a different number of letters on each side, two and four, it should make a staggered cut. And so people looked at number two and they're like, well, why doesn't this one make a staggered cut? It has um, a different number of letters on each side. The problem is this one is not palindromic. So the enzyme recognizes this side, G-A-A-T-C, and it makes the cut between the A and the T, but when the enzyme goes to the other side, there's no code that matches. There is no G-A-A-T-C. So the enzyme can't attach. So technically, this doesn't make a cut at all because it would only cut one side of the DNA and it wouldn't cut the other side. So if it's not palindromic, the enzyme wouldn't cut all the way through the DNA, period. 
Um, so those two really don't even count for blunt or staggered because they don't cut all the way through the DNA. Okay, so this last segment is like the third thing we did in the lab. We are using a plasmid to transform bacteria. So what does that mean? That means we have a bacteria and we have a plasmid. So this is my bacteria. The plasmid has two genes on it, an AMP gene, and that makes it resistant to ampicillin, meaning it can survive in the antibiotic ampicillin. And then it has what we're calling the P-glow gene, which basically makes it glow bright green under UV light. Uh, but if you read the scenario, this gene is only triggered by the presence of the sugar arabinose. If that sugar is not present, it doesn't matter. They, they may have the gene, but they won't actually glow because they'll only make that protein if the arabinose is present to trigger the, protein, the, uh, the gene. Okay, so when we put our bacteria through our transformation process, we're going to have a whole bunch of bacteria. Some of them are going to pick up the plasmid and some are not. Um, and, and so this is the whole idea, is that we're growing them in these different plates. So plate number one has LB agar. LB, remember, is Luria broth. That's just food. There's no ampicillin and there's no arabinose. So what will grow on this plate? Basically, everything will grow on this plate. There's nothing to kill the bacteria that didn't pick up the plasmid. And what color will they be? They will all be white. Why? Because since there's no arabinose on the plate, and this is the trigger for them to glow, there's even if they picked up the plasmid, the gene is not activated, and so they'll just be white. All right, plate number two. We're giving them food, which is good, um, and we're adding ampicillin. Now, ampicillin, remember, this will kill any bacteria that did not pick up the plasmid. Um, but we're not adding any arabinose, and arabinose is the trigger to make them glow. So in this second plate, again, they're all going to be white. However, a little notation here, only the ones that picked up the plasmid will actually be growing on this plate because the other ones will be killed by the ampicillin, but they're not going to be glowing. Plate number three, food, no ampicillin, and we added arabinose. Now remember, arabinose is the trigger to make them glow. But here's the thing, since there's no ampicillin on the plate, and the ampicillin is what kills the one that's, that didn't get the plasmid, on this plate, we're gonna see both white and green bacteria. Why? Because the ones that did not pick up the plasmid will be white, and the ones that did pick up the plasmid will glow green under UV light and there's no, nothing to kill the ones that didn't. In our last plate, we added both ampicillin and arabinose. Ampicillin kills bacteria without the plasmid. Arabinose triggers them to make the glowing protein. So on this plate, we should only see green bacteria growing because only those that picked up the plasmid are gonna be growing. So plate one, they'll all be white. Plate two, they'll all be white. Plate three, white and green will show up, and on plate four, only green. Now, on which plates, basically what they're asking in B, is on which plates will the student know that only bacteria that picked up the plasmid are growing? Obviously, if you have a UV light, you could shine, and if all the bacteria were green, you would know that, but you don't have to have a UV light to know which ones are pure. Remember, ampicillin kills bacteria. So if we added any plate that we added ampicillin to should kill the bacteria without plasmid. So the answer to this question, on which plates do we know bacteria picked up the plasmid? Plate number two and plate number four. Because both of these plates contained ampicillin, which would have killed any bacteria that did not pick up the plasmid. Um, if you need more help with this, there are three more practice problems in another recording I made uh, from, the, from the lecture. So refer back to that for practice or read about it in the lab that we did. This is, this is the exact um, plasmid that we used in the lab.